Peter. It's a pleasure, real pleasure, to have all this audience here and have the opportunity to bring at the limits to Brazil and particularly to Unicamp. So I really need to mention Derek Yellow, who gave me this opportunity and put me into the trouble to defend ATDL against Peter Liebe believes. So I'll do my best, Peter, but I'm not sure if I can succeed to convince you. I have no conflict of interest for this presentation. And my questions are, how could ADL benefit people with myocardial infarction? And if this is so, how could myocardial infarction change ADL metabolism, phenotype, and function? And finally, is there any opportunity in this interaction between ATDL and myocardial infarction for preventing or improving outcome in patients with acute coronary syndrome? Let's look for this data. These two time trend graphics, first from Medicare, United States, 4.3 million of patients who discharged after myocardial infarction. And we are seeing here the third day events rate. And you see in two decades, an 8% decrease in mortality rate, short term mortality rate. Look at the grace, this paper from Kate Flox, we have 44,000 patients with acute coronary syndrome. You see more or less the same. They look at the incidence of cardiovascular events in the first 30 days after myocardial infarction. And as you can see here, heart failure decreased very well. So, it's more than probable that this effect results for the increased number of PCI or hyperfusion therapy. So we may conclude that probably it's plausible that we are getting fact size smaller and smaller with time. But if this is so, is it get small enough? Did you reach the limits in the fact size? And finally, how can you reduce even more myocardial infarction? Is it possible to do? Well, now I bring some review that uh, I appreciate very much. It was the first time I have some contact with Derek Yellow. It's a seminal review published in New England some years ago, showing that if you do not hyperfuse your myocardial infarction, you can get 70% of this chemical area becoming infected. If you have a yearly hyperfusion therapy, you can decrease this infarct size by 40%. This is what we are doing now in good centers. This is why we are reducing mortality and the incidence of heart failure. But if you can prevent hyperfusion lesion, you can reduce 25% more. And this would be the answer. Yes, you can reduce infarct size even more and can improve the outcome of patients with myocardial infarction. You can start from 70% for something around 5% of infarct size. Several labs in the world, including mine, tested ADL during hyperfusion using Langdorf model, uh, Wister rats, hearts. And as you can see in this set of experiments, we see that as we increase the doses of ADL, you decrease the size of myocardial infarction. So it's, it has been reproduced again and again several times. So we have reason to believe, but the question is how ADL would protect myocardial infarction? And what in ADL would protect myocardial infarction? So I have to come back. Now I have to come back for a first base of evidence suggesting that ADL has some value for humans. And, oops, I'm sorry, it's the old presentation, you will not change it. Okay, the first evidence came for 60 million of years of development. So we conserved ADL despite of 16 million of the evolution of human beings. And during more or almost the 60 million of years, we didn't have myocardial infarction. So why did we keep ADL? And we have several species, including pork, rabbit, rats, that never develop atherosclerosis. Why do they have ADL? ADL is much more than some bullet or silver bullet to protect against atherosclerosis. ETDL is a nanoparticle, set of nanoparticles with 6 to 12 nanometers. It's 1,000 times smaller than an endothelial cell. That carry several proteins. Uh, it is described up to 95 proteins, several lipids, several RNA, microRNAs, more RNAs, and they have several functions. Like, for example, attenuation of acute phase inflammatory response 
including binding of LSPS and also decreasing the endothelial response to a TNF, containment of oxidative stress, crosstalk between cells. There's a publication one week ago showing that ADL can communicate beta cells with hepatocytes carrying MIR-375, induced by insulin. So ADL is a good way of make communication from distant cells. Platform for assembly of proteins. I said that it, there is, uh, it, it means I described 95 proteins that can be inside ADL, but ADL is a very small particle. They only can contain three, four proteins. So you can imagine how many sets of ADL there exists and the qualitative and quantitative chance between them. I have a group of, of Brazilian researchers that found that one of these sets of ADL may kill trypanosoma and may protect against Chagas disease. So we are talking about something much, much more complex than prevention of atherosclerosis. I just put it out, this, all these functions that by this way, ATL can protect against myocardial infarctions. This paper came out two years ago and it was striking us because we are trying to do the same and they did first. This group showed that when you perhaps a fund myocardial infarction, you use ATDL, you can increase the uptake of glucose and glycolysis. They use the FD, FDG, fluodeoxyglycose, here as you can see, uh, after hyperfusion, use saline, using uh, constituted ADL and increase the uptake of glucose and also the glycolytic capacity and glycolysis. And they use the very known data showing that the ATP generated per oxygen atoms is much higher when you have glucose than pyruvate, palmitate, or uh, beta hydroxybutyrate. So when you have ischemia, you have less oxygen, it's much better to use glucose, so the answer. And they found a very good correlation between the infarct size and the uptake of glucose. We did more or less the same using humans, and the first study we did was using clump, your glycemic, your hyperglycemic clump. There's a very uh, uh, laboring procedure, so we are excited to, to make in 26 patients with STEMI at the first day and the fifth day after myocardial infarction. And we divide by the median uh, level of ADL that was 36. And as you can see here, for those with low, oh, the point's not working, uh, at people with low uh, ADL, there was a decrease in insulin sensitivity between the first and the fifth day. For those with ADL elevated, higher than 36, there was an increase in insulin sensitivity. But 26 patients, come on, it's a very short piece of paper. Patients, we need to have more. And we did again using 103 patients, not with clamp, but using HOMA index, and we found the same. So as high the HDL, as high the recovery of insulin sensitivity. But we also tested insulin secretion using disposition index. It is a way of testing insulin secretion adjusted for insulin sensitivity. And as you can see here, we have also an increase in insulin secretion as the patients have higher ATDL. This is not really new. This was only new in patients with acute coronary syndrome. We know for some period of time that ADL based on APA1 can induce insulin sensitivity by two main mechanisms. Inducing efflux can activate the P1, 3K, AKT cascade and by this way transmigrate GLUT4, but also Inducing a flux, maybe a ABCA1 can increase the calcium influx and then calmodulin kinase and then transport of GLUT4, including uptake of glucose. Very recently, uh, Kenny Wright published data, interesting data showing that the binding of APA1 or ABC1 also induces insulin secretion based on PQA. Phosphokinase A stimulates calcium flux and secretion of insulin and at the same time transmigrates to the nucleus stimulate insulin transcription. So ATDL and APOAN can increase both insulin sensitivity and insulin secretion and by this way increase the uptake of glucose in myocardial tissue. ADL also modulates nitroxide synthesis and also by two different mechanisms. First of them, the most known of them was APA1 binding to SRB1, also activate the same cascade that also activate in those. But more recently, we knew that ATL may do this using S1P. During ischemia, 
S1P is a phospholip made by sphingosine phosphorylated, and this phosphorylating occurs when you have ischemia, when you have stimuli, and during ischemia, sphingosine kinase stimulates the production of S1P and product of S1P enrich HDL, and by these ways, HDL enrich in S1P, activate macrophage, reducing apoptosis, activate endothelial cells, stimulating nitrate oxide synthesis, and activate several receptors in myocardial cells, decreasing apoptosis and protecting mitochondria. What evidence you have that this cause or, or happen in patients? We use Langendorf procedures, and as you can see here, we have perfumed these rats with HDL or control, and you see the coronary flow during all the procedures that is much higher than compared with control group. We also measure nitric oxide in coronary artery. We see increased levels of nitric oxide during all the hyperfusion period. So you can say, okay, you vasodilate, you have smaller in fact size, but is really so? I'm not so sure. We tested nit both nitric oxide and coronary resistance correlation with fact size. And you see very beautiful linear regression show association, but. At the same time, when you produce nitric oxide, you can vasodilate, but you can also have direct effect on nitric oxide on myocardial cells. One of them is stimulating the potenkinase G that decreases cell death. So you tested using LNAM to block the synthesis of nitric oxide, and as you can see, HDL alone decreasing fact size, HDL plus LNAM, the effect was gone. So we made the hydralazine together to keep the coronary flow. And keeping the coronary flow, we still didn't have any protection. So it seems that is not only vasodilation. That means sense when you look behind EZ2 trial, or GC2 trial, I'm sorry, and some trials that show that nitroglycerin did not reduce mortality after myocardial infarction. What is the interest in this data is that, as I, I told you, uh, healthy HDL may stimulate the AKT cascade, and by this way, stimulate uptake of glucose and production of nitric oxide. But the same doesn't happen when you use HDL for patients with myocardial infarction. When you use patients with this, uh, HDL from these patients, you activate blocks and you block the activation of NOs. It was showed uh, in GCI two, two, three years ago, and it is very well produced, this effect. And also we know that not only uh, the content of oxida oxidation products in change, but also the protein change. So two studies using patients with acute and chronic coronary disease looking at proteomics inside the HDL. And as you can see here, we increase very much the number of proteins related to acute phase, pro acute phase response in most of them cell amyloid A and also proteins related to complement activation. So it's possible by this kind of data that you became pro-inflammatory. So we tested this using the telial cell, coronary endothelial cells, and as you know, it's expected that ATO protects the telial cells from uh, the stimulus from a TNF. So we co-incubated uh, endothelial cells with TNF and healthy HDL and verify the production of adhesive molecules, VK in this case. And as you can see, putting health HDL, we decrease 24% the production of adhesive molecules. Okay, we collected HDL from patient the first 24 hours after myocardial infarction, and we found more or less the same. At the 50 day, this protection was gone. So something got inside HDL that was no longer able to protect against this pro inflammatory stimulant. In 30 days, this protection come back again, at least partially protection coming back again. What else can happen to ATDL during acute phase? Oxidation is not a simple pro pro uh, process. It can happen to modify proteins, modify function of proteins. In the set of experiments has shown that methionine, tyrosine, leucine, tryptophan can be oxidized and can change the way AP1 can perform. In this study, methionine oxidation and uh, tyrosine oxidation decrease the capacity of ATL to make cholesterol flux and also to activate cholesterol esterification, activate LCAT. And these effects are closely related to myeloperoxidase activity. So 
it's possible that one of the main drivers for change in ADL during acute phase of myocardial infarction is myeloperoxidase, and we can solve this problem by two ways. We have now ways of, pro of inhibiting myeloperoxidase. There are some studies in animal models showing benefit in myocardial infarction. But we can also change these residues. You can change for neutral amino acids and this way prevent oxidation of these residues. It was done. And the only one change that resulted in some protection, and protection was only for cholesterol flux, was changed in tryptophan for, for, for phenylalanine. Uh, and it's still trying to find some other things. Metabolism of AGL also changed during myocardial infarction. We found that cholesterol flux capacity was reduced by 9%, and CTP activity reduced by 25%, and because of this, cholesterol transfer and triglyceride transfer is reduced as well. Despite of the reduction of, cholesterol, of CTP activity, we found a reduction in, in ADL size that probably related to the change in the content of ADL and the reduction in ADL cholesterol concentration. The last, more expected way of protecting myocardial infarction would be, in my opinion, at, at the beginning, uh, the protection against oxidation. So we try to see what's happening in the ability of ATL to protect against oxidation. Uh, this experiment reduced oxidation incubating LDL, ATDL, and copper sulfate. And by this way, you follow during 24 hours the formation of oxidation products. Using ATDL, you can see here is the oxidation of LDL alone, or ATDL alone, sorry, ATL plus LDL, and you see that there is a protection of oxidation of LDL. At the first day of mitochondrial infarction, you found the same. At the fifth day, you lose again this capacity. And this capacity is not completely recovered at 30 days. So maybe what's, what could cause the, 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 the decrease in the capacity of oxidation? Maybe there is a saturation. As I commented to you in the beginning of my presentation, during 16 million of years, our longevity go of as up to 30 years, 40 years old. So there was no time for having myocardial infarction. Maybe myocardial infarction is too high oxidative stress for ATDL. So this ATDL may be dysfunctional after myocardial infarction. So testing this, we collect again ATL in the first day, fifth to third day, and look at T-bars content inside ATL to verify the oxidation products inside ATL. And as you can see, there is an increase. So ATL works like a scavenger for these oxida oxidation products. And this is directly related to flow mediator dilation. So this ATL be dis be dysfunctional in remote arteries like brachial arteries testing the tineal function. But if this is the real thing, I'm afraid not because of the endothelial function, I'm afraid of the protection of myocardial infarction, since we need to produce nitroxides to protect myocardial infarction using ATDL. So I collected again ATDL from these patients, I put this ATDL over endothelial cells and verified the production of nitroxides. Again, PBS, health FDL increased the production of nitroxides. Stem ADL, no effect. Looking at patients at baseline ATL cholesterol levels, we found an even worse result. As high the ATL cholesterol at the admission of myocardial infarction, as low would be the flow mediator dilation 30 days after myocardial infarction. So something happened during myocardial infarction that being warm for, for these patients. An ADL that can contain the oxidative stress can become pro-oxidative uh, in this period of time. Looking at the effect of myocardial infarction using MRI, we found the same. As higher the concentration of ADL, as higher the infarct size, estimated by MRI, but also estimated by CKMB. When you look at this polynomial regression, 3D regression, it, it seems to be really clear that this effect is dependent of the time for hyperfusion. If you see the effect in the first two, four hours, the effect is very steep and tend to decrease after time. Look at linear regression, several linear regressions after four hours of hyperfusion, after four hours of myocardial infarct onset, this effect loses statistical significance. So it means that you need to have hyperfusion to have the good and the bad from ATL. 
the way ADL may produce lesions or protect against lesions is related to hyperfusion. One more test to verify this, you made again. Lung off using rat, and you test again health FDL, and we decrease in fact size, and we improve in systolic function. ADL from myocardial infarction patient will have no effect at the first day, at the fifth day. Systolic function or in fact size. So it seems that we have two realities here. If you have a health FDL and you have a myocardial infarct, you can be protected with it. If you have a dysfunctional FDL that's very often found in patients with myocardial infarct, you have no protection at all. So there is no sense of giving medication to increase HDL cholesterol levels. That's why so many studies trying to increase HDL cholesterol levels seems to be nonsense. We have to change the way HDL works, not the quantity of HDL. This is an example of this. These three trials try to give reconstituted HDL for patients two weeks after acute coronary syndrome. When they gave a very large amount of doses, considering that this patient, consider a patient with eight kilograms, you have more or less 20 grams of native HDL. When they gave three to six grams of reconstituted HDL, they decreased the ateroma volume. The problem is that they had hepatotoxicity. ADL is very driver to liver. So they come straight to liver, stimulate NASH, so they, this was a problem. Then they reduced the dose, try a second try, use APO1 Milano, they reduced it less, no toxicity, and 1.2 to 1.4 grams of reconstituted ADL seems to be okay. But still they want to push the bar a little bit far, and they gave three milligrams in the last trial, and no result. So what is to give 0.24 grams of reconstituted ADL over 20 grams of native ADL that, is, that are dysfunctional for sure? So the dilution effect prevent any expectation of benefit. So my concept is that if you need to use ADL to protect people, to prevent death, to reduce myocardial infarction, you have to rethink about ADL. ATL is not LDL, it's much more complex, but much more powerful, if you will. For concluding, we are far to be at the limits with LDL. We are just beginning to see what's happened, what is this nanoparticle, so important for preventing disease, several diseases. A have healthy LDL may prevent ischemia hyperfusion injury and reduce myocardial infarction size. But several factors that stimulate you to have myocardial infarction or after you have myocardial infarction, can change completely the way ADL protects. So the future will be for sure trying to use some ADL with uh, APOE1 with protection, changing amino acids to be resistant to oxidation, or use enough dose to prevent uh, the accumulation or the dilution effect with the no, huge volume of dysfunctional ADL that's often found in these patients. I have to thank to these guys who made the real hard job. I only have to tell you what they did. Thank you so much.